Greetings, Word Horde. We're here with an exciting option for you, a version of our podcast without any ads. That's right. No advertising interruptions, just the content you love, ready to go in your favorite podcast apps like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's another way to support the show, ensuring that we keep bringing you the word stories and language explorations that you love. Try it at waywardradio.org slash ad free. And it's affordable. For just a small subscription fee, you can enjoy a way with words uninterrupted, except by us. Plus, it makes a great gift. Know somebody who loves language as much as you do? Give them the gift of words. Easy to sign up, easy to enjoy. It's the same away with words, just streamlined for your listening pleasure. Go to waywardradio.org slash adfree. Support us, support the show, and enjoy an ad-free listening experience. waywardradio.org slash adfree. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. We've all had the experience of trying to remember a word, having something right on the tip of our tongue and just not being able to reach it. And that experience made me appreciate this tweet from someone who goes by the name Fisty on uh, Twitter. She said, when I was pregnant with my first, I cried one day because I forgot the word banana. I described it to my then husband It comes in its own case. It's yellow. (laughs) I can so relate to that. A lemon? (laughs) Oh, it could have been. Yeah. (laughs) But there's a word for that. Do you know the word for this? No. Lethologica. Lethologica. Yes. This is Leth. I think I know that root. Yeah. The the river Lethe in Greek mythology was one of the several rivers in Hades. If you drank from this particular river, also known as the River of Oblivion, you would forget everything. Everything, oh, the river yeah. Lethe. River of Forgetting is how we learned it. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So, so you remember? Yeah, I did remember that. One. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else is going though, <laughs> so that's that's nice. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else tweeted, "Not in the same league, but I once completely blanked on iceberg lettuce and had to call it Arctic cabbage instead." <laughs> My wife has never ever let me forget this one. It was over twenty five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Arctic. That's great. That's good. <laughs> but I'm so fascinated to think about how it is that you sort of go through your mind and try to figure it out. Like sometimes you know that it starts with a B Mm -hmm. or it has a certain number of syllables and a certain accent Mm -hmm. in the word, but you can't quite figure it out. Yeah, we know some physiological things about memory that suggest that where we store words isn't the same place where we store the attributes that belong to those words. Mm. So the different characteristics that the word may connote or denote might be in a different place. So you can forget a word, but remember things about it, the same way that you can forget someone's name but remember their face. Right, right. If you've got a story about forgetting a word and finding a way to work around it, let us know, 877-929-9673, or send it to us in email. That address is words at waywardradio.org. Hi there, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Betsy over here in Escondido, California. I was listening to the news the other day, and they said the suspect was at large. Now, I think most everybody knows what that means, but why? (laughs) Why does at large mean, what did you take it to mean? At large. (laughs) Well, we know what it means. You know, the suspect's missing or what have you. Um, But I just thought at large is kind of a strange way to say it when you think about it. Yeah, kind of. Um, It's got a long history that came to us through Latin and French. There have been a number of different phrases and different eras in Latin and French, so Old French and Middle French and Norman French, and then borrowed into English kind of as a legal phrase, and to mean at liberty. And all of the different old versions of it in Latin and French more or less mean um, not restrained, not fixed to place, not, uh, not, not permanently held. So someone at large means that they are away from any kind of control. So we talk about suspects at large. But you know, you can also have... Um, People who work for companies and they can say that they're they're vice president at large, which means that they're not fixed to any one task or department. Oh. They're kind of given assignments here and there as needed. I see. So large and liberty are sort of related in history. Is that it? Yeah. So it's not large as in size. It has more, large more to do as, um, I believe it's related to distance. Mm-hmm. Kind of expansive. Yeah. In trying to, you know, figure out why we say that. I was trying to think of other things that are similar, 
And the only thing I could think of is by and large. And then I began thinking about by and large, and I began to wonder if it was by in large or by and large. <laughs> but I want to know, is by and large connected to at large? They are connected because they're part of English, and they both contain the word large. But etymologically, they're, <laughs> they're distinct, and they don't have any relationship at all. By and large, as far as I understand, is a nautical term. Mm -hmm. It refers to... Um, basically means to keep a ship sailing in a direction, but every once in a while sailing toward the wind or as close as you can get and still maintain forward momentum and then kind of sailing off the wind, kind of moving back and forth, but still generally heading towards your destination. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so, great. So by has a particular meaning in nautical language, which is more or less meaning um, toward or in the general direction of. So when we say by and large, don't we mean sort of almost all? Well, by for by the most part, yes. So we might say, well, by and large, that was a successful campaign that we ran to promote our product, right? Meaning all yeah. in all, or hmm. more or less, generally, or generally, yeah. And what we're talking about here. If a ship is sailing by and large, it means it's not headed in a straight line toward its destination. It's a little bit one way. It's a little bit the other way. It's a little bit one oh. way. It's a little bit the other way. Okay. And, but it still gets there. So they're not connected at all, but the ship could be at large. Yeah. Ship could, and, and I don't <laughs> yeah, even, if they're fleeing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Whoever's on the ship is at large that's sailing by large. Yes. By and large. So it's by and large. Well, A-N-D. Okay. Yeah. And it's B-Y. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's B-Y space A-N-D space large. Okay, gotcha. very good. Now I know for sure. I think it gets kind of slurred into by in large. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we do that in English. We tend to drop that D on and, and it's sometimes hard to hear. Thanks for calling, Betsy. Very good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. got a voicemail that I really appreciated from Jackie Cerebrini Kessner, who lives in Massachusetts, and it was about misunderstanding a name. She said, I used to watch a show called Captain Kangaroo and loved it. You'd know you'd have to take out your cardboard shoebox and your scissors and your papers and paste and colored paper and construct these wonderful things. And one of his friends was Mr. Green Jeans. And as a child in the 60s, we only had a black and white TV. So years later, she goes to college and she's talking in, in I think it was a, a child development course, about um, art and literature for children. And she said... I thought I had this great example of how they rushed you through the art activity. By the time they have all of your supplies that they needed, they were finished making the entire creation. And how much I loved Mr. Green Jeans because he understood and gave you more time. But at the time, I referred to him as Mr. Cream Cheese. <laughs> because, again, remember, we had a black and white TV. And as a little Jewish girl growing up in upstate New York, I grew up having bagels and cream cheese. So I always thought it was Mr. Cream Cheese. <laughs> Bless your heart, Jackie. And so the whole class laughed at her. Aww. But I have to tell you that I had this epiphany when I listened to this voicemail. Yeah. Because I had a black and white TV as well yeah, when so I watched we. Captain Kangaroo. Yes, we did too. And I did not know until yesterday that Mr. Green Jeans wore green jeans. <laughs> I did not know this. I went online and looked at all these old pictures of him. He wore green. I, it never occurred to me. I always, we watched, I watched Captain Kangaroo in the 70s on a black and white TV, yeah. A, yeah. a remote station out of Paducah, Kentucky. Oh, and yeah? I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I just assumed they were green. <laughs> you did? Yes. Uh, I think I thought he was green, like growing things, but, but, so I was Mr. shocked. Mr. Cream Cheese, though. Yeah. That's the best. Oh, it's, kids. It's are wonderful, aren't they? I love that. <laughs> we have an endless capacity to absorb your childhood misunderstandings, and we will laugh with you and not at you. Give us a call, 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello. Hi, who's this? This is Frida Wara, and I'm calling you from Marquette, Michigan. Frida, welcome to the show. Well, I'd like to share uh, a couple of things. I heard a show a little bit back that got me thinking about a Finnish proverb, and in, in Finnish, it says, until the food is ready, feed your guests with words. And I just love how you gather around the table, and that's just a real special part of any meal. And if anybody's ever read the Kalevala, that's our epic poem and always about stories. And 
um, those proverbs are just a real special part of our heritage. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Until the food is ready, feed your guests with words, huh? Yeah. What does that sound like in Finnish? Oh, boy, don't even make me get there. But it's like, Enen kuen ruaka on valmis syötä virorasi sanoilla. So there's never a silent letter in Finnish. (laughs) (laughs) I also wanted to share another word that we have that is in everybody's vocabulary right now because we are at over 200 inches of snow. 200 inches in this season? Yeah, and we're just, um, you know, not even wrapping up. We have a very, um, uh, on the calendar, we either call it a St. Patrick's Day storm, which is on March 17th, or it's a St. Orho's Day storm, which is the Finnish god of the grapes. And that's on March 16th. So you wear purple on the 16th and green on the 17th. But don't you dare wear green on the 16th just because St. Orho chased the grasshoppers out of Finland to save the grape crop. So um, we always have a big storm around that time of year. Uh Uh-huh. And is there a lot of wine involved? Yeah. And usually that means that your hangover then is like, you don't even want to look at a green beer, um, (laughs) if beer at all, but certainly not a green beer on the 17th. (laughs) We we use the word pank, P-A-N-K. And I don't hear it many other places. I mean, certainly there's a lot of regions in the country, even Las Vegas, that's shoveling snow this year. But, you know, when you go camping, you certainly don't shovel the snow at your tent site. You have to pank the snow. And if you're making a good trail for either skiing or snow biking or dog sledding or skidoring, you don't shovel there either. You pank the snow. So it, you can also pank dough and make biscuits or, or um, cookie dough or whatever it might be. But that word pank is to, to flatten it out and, and pank it down. Right, to pack it down, right? Yeah, you youpers are very proud of using that word. That that often comes up when we're talking uh, with youpers. It's it's uh, chiefly there in northern Michigan, also in uh, parts of Pennsylvania and upstate New York. And we're not sure what the origin of pank is. It might have to do with with a combination of pack and spank, or it might uh, go back to a Scandinavian term that means to knock or beat or something like that. But uh, but yeah, y'all are really proud of that word. <laughs> And you can do it to snow or yeah. sandcastles paint, or paint down the flour in a measuring cup, right? Yeah, right. Oh, that's a good example. Or the brown paint, sugar. Paint down your hair <laughs> <laughs> if you've got bedhead. <laughs> yeah, it's a great word, but you don't hear it much outside no, of the, your part of the country. Definitely a regional term. Frida, you've been a delight. Thank you for calling us. We really appreciate it. Oh, and thank you so much. I just so enjoy your your <laughs> program. And you know, way back when the Kalevala first started. They said it was born where words, not swords, were the tools of magic. And I like that. I like that, too. That's lovely. All right. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Got a minute? We need your help. Head over to gum.fm slash words and share your thoughts in our quick survey. Your feedback matters. It's the backbone of our show's success. Thanks for making our show even more successful. That's G-U-M dot F-M slash W-O-R-D-S. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Baird, and we're joined by our quiz guy, John Chinesky from New York City. Hi, John. Hi, Grant. Hi, Martha. Hi. I decided that if this week's quiz is not the most difficult, then it would at least be the most educational. It's all about the moon. Okay? Okay. 
early Native American tribes recorded time by keeping track of the seasons and the lunar months. And as such, they gave nicknames to each of the full moons that occurred during different parts of the seasons. Now, one example, you might remember this from the news at the start of 2019, lupines tended to howl more at the moon in the middle of winter, so the full moon in January is known by what nickname? The wolf, wolf moon. The wolf moon, right. We had a super full blood wolf moon at, in the beginning of uh, 2019. Now, let's see if you know some of the others. February is so deep in the season that much of the food put aside for the winter might run low, so the full moon is given what nickname? The barren moon? No. How do you feel? Empty? Empty moon? Hungry moon? Stuffed? Starved moon? It is, <laughs> it is the full hunger moon. The oh. hunger February, moon. yes. Oh, very nice. good. In March, we start to see robins appear. That's because they're looking for food now that the frozen earth has thawed. So the full moon in March is given what nickname? The worm moon. Yes, the full oh, worm really? moon. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's how it works. So these are real what? names. These aren't these just are stuck actual, to the puzzle. Yeah. Okay, great. Yes, they are not. Yeah. Wow, these I somehow mean, escaped me until now. This is wonderful. Now. now, the nickname for the full moon in May is not surprising. It parallels nicely with a very common saying about April and May that most of us are familiar with. What's that nickname? Shower? Rain moon? Uh, that's April. What happens in May? Oh. The flower moon? Yes, the full flower moon. John Lennon could tell you that fields of ripening fruit in June give its full moon its nickname. What is it? Strawberry moon. Yes, the mm. full strawberry moon in June. Antlers hit their full growth in June, leading to July's full moon name. It's got nothing to do with dollars. Buck moon? Yes, the full buck moon. That's July. Corn and barley and other crops are ripe in September and October, which inspires what nickname that gained fame due to a pop standard from Tin Pan Alley in the Ziegfeld Follies era? Hmm. Isn't that harvest moon? Yes, uh, the full harvest oh. moon. Very good. The leaves are falling in October, and the previously mentioned buck are fat, which means both people and the previously mentioned wolves are looking for game, inspiring what nickname? The hunter's, hunter's. moon. The full hunter moon, yes. The full cold moon is in December. That's no surprise. But the days are getting shorter, too, naturally leading to a complementary occurrence that inspires what nickname? Ice moon? Now, the days are getting long shorter. Long night moon. Dark moon. Yes, the long <laughs> oh, night's oh, moon. Okay. The full oh, really? <laughs> long night's moon. Just making these up. No, you're, you're making up a correct answer, so <laughs> congratulations. You guys did fantastic. You guys uh, get uh, top marks on moon, moon studies. All right. We'll talk to you next week, bud. Talk to you then. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And we'd love to talk with you about any aspect of language whatsoever. Slang, grammar, word origins, regional dialects, linguistic diversity. So call us, 877-929-9673, or send your emails to words at waywardradio.org. Welcome to Away With Words. Hi, my name's Paloma, and I'm calling from Escondido. How are you? Hi, Paloma. Another Escondido call. Glad to have you on the show. Hi, Paloma. Hi. Thanks for having me. Sure. What's up? You know, Away With Words has really opened my eyes to a new way of looking at language. Um, I used to be really caught up in rules and what is right and what is wrong. And I uh, recently went to your live show in San Diego, and I just love the way that you guys look at words from a place of curiosity instead of uh, criticism. And, um, you know, I had your radio show to help open my eyes to this new perspective. But I was wondering how were each of you introduced to exploring language with a sense of wonder? Was there an aha moment or someone special in your life that released you from that judgmental viewpoint? I just want to say thank you, Paloma. Um, we hooked another one, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> Paloma, you, you got it. You, you, you got it. That's what we're trying to do here. We, we do believe in rules. We follow them all the time. We are hard on ourselves mm -hmm. when it comes to writing and speaking well. And we, you know, every mistake that we make, we're like, oh, no, I did that on the air. <laughs> but we're forgiving of other people. And I think that's what you heard at our live show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a lovely question. I, I would say for myself that it's been something of a journey for me. I think I arrived at this show very well schooled in grammar and rules that you get taught in school, in part because my beloved mother was an English teacher 
Uh, mm. She taught uh, eighth grade language arts. And if somebody made a grammatical error in her class, she was famous for going to the chalkboard, putting her fingernails up at the chalkboard <gasps> and dragging uh, them down no. the chalkboard and saying, oh. that's what that sounds like to me. <laughs> oh my wow. Yeah. And she was really funny about it. I mean, I mean, I still hear from, from uh, students who adored her. But I learned over the years to be just judgy about uh, grammar and use of grammar and and uh, you know I would I would hear a misuse of a, of a word or phrase and and it, and I would sort of you know go back to that idea of uh, fingernails mm-hmm. coming down a chalkboard but the more I got involved in uh, working on the show over the years I just came to see that there's so much other wonder as you said there's so mm-hmm. much uh, more to talk about when it comes to language so much more I just I feel like I had a little keyhole view of language and now I have this big expansive view of it bay window mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> at least a panorama and particularly in my case I've talked before about about a tutor who opened my eyes to connections between and among languages because there's this big web of language that connects so many words uh, that uh, come from Indo-European languages. Um, but Grant had a different path. Yeah, my path, I, I was a reader of kind of an autodidact in a lot of ways, always going above and beyond what I was told to read in schools, reading a lot of high mm-hmm. literature and a lot of low and things in between. So I was very undisciplined and unschooled in the kind of stuff that I put into my brain. And it kind of came out in my writing. So when I went to the University of Missouri to become a journalism student, I realized I I didn't have a real strong, consistent mastery of this basic writing style that journalists had, how, how to get stuff out quickly on the page, explain complicated subjects, get it, make it grammatical, do the punctuation correctly, that sort of stuff. And mm-hmm. so I sought some help. And I hit upon, this was a just prior to the internet becoming a thing for most people, American Dialects Society has been an organization since the 1800s where academics and and dilettantes of all stripes have gotten together to talk about American English or English as it's spoken in North America. And I joined their email list. And over the years since then, I learned so much from these people. And it turns out a lot of them were lexicographers who believe that language should be Snapshot it. You take a picture of it as it is rather than trying to force people to believe it's something it isn't. And a lot of the people on in the American Dialect Society and on their email list are sociolinguists. And sociolinguists are very similar. They look at language as it actually is and how it relates to people's relationships to each other. Sociolinguistics is about uh, language in communities, language in groups rather than, you know, mm-hmm. single words. And so both of these communities have informed me and the way that I see language. My wife also is a sociolinguist and a lexicographer. And um, there's a reason that we're together because we uh, we look at language and go, oh, wow, that's cool rather than, go, oh, wow, that's dumb. And that's kind of just mm-hmm. what we try to teach on the show. When you encounter something new rather than being repulsed by its newness, being open to its newness and say, who else does this? Where are they? Do they have anything co- in common with all the other people who who do it? Is is this something I can learn more about from other people who have studied it? And all those answers lead you down wonderful paths, and that's what we do on the show. Oh, I love it. And I, I just love that description of language being a web. It, it goes across communities, and it also goes back into the past because words have such interesting histories and uh, carry with them so many uh, little cultural nuances that it's just mm-hmm. a gold mine. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah, and you've raised another great point about linguistic diversity. The more we do this show, the more we hear from all different kinds of people. We're learning from our, our callers all the time. And mm-hmm. and I, I came to the show thinking there was one standard English, one particular <laughs> English that everybody should speak. But the fact is they're all different kinds of Englishes. I mean, Jamaican English, South African English. And there's English, never been one British English. English. There's never right. been a sole perfect English. Right. It hasn't yeah. existed ever. Yeah. Right. And so it's, it was really a matter of kind of opening up the world. World. I'm so ah. glad, Paloma, that you caught on to our message, and I hope you're evangelizing it with us. Oh, I am. Absolutely. I love it, and I'm so grateful for your show and all of the work that all of you do for this uh, radio program. It's really opened my eyes. Thank so you thank very you. much. Fantastic. It's lovely to hear, and it's very nice to talk to you, Paloma. <laughs> you too. Bye, guys. Have a great Take day. Care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. You know what? I'd love to hear from more people like Paloma who've had a change of heart about how they judge or don't judge the language of other people. 
Give us a call, 877-929-9673, or email words at waywardradio.org, or tell us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. My friend Julie asked me if I knew the expression, take me to raise. Do you know this expression? Mm -mm. She said she learned it from somebody who grew up in Calhoun, Kentucky. She wrote me and said, I had saved her a seat in church for some pageant or something. And when she got there, she asked, did you think you'd taken me to raise? I had never heard it and wondered where raise was. But she meant I was taking care of her by saving her a seat. And so it was as if I had signed on to raise her. Oh, taking me that to raise. So kind it's, not, of raise. it's not capital R like I raise know. pizza in New York or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, oh. I was thinking it was a bar. R A I S E. Yeah, okay. and apparently this is pretty widespread in certain areas, particularly Kentucky, Ohio. And uh, like a kid might dismiss an unreasonable request from another kid on the playground saying, uh, I ain't took you to raise. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Yes. <laughs> Hit us up and email words at waywardradio.org. Welcome to Away With Words. Hi. Hi, who's this? This is Josiah Sendebaugh calling from San Antonio. Welcome, Josiah. What can we do for you? Well, I had a question about uh, traffic. Uh, what would we call not traffic? Because I hear people say, like, wow, look at this great traffic. And I've just been wondering, like, what would the word be for not traffic? <laughs> huh. Where are they when they're saying, look at this great traffic? Are they driving? Yes, they are driving. Then they are the traffic. If you're driving, you are traffic. I, I was wondering what would the word be called for not traffic, if there is a word for that. So we're talking empty empty highways, empty streets. Mm-hmm. And Josiah, do you spend a lot of time in traffic? Are you in a carpool or something? Yes. Okay, so you hear adults commenting on the traffic and and saying, wow, this is great traffic, meaning there's not much traffic? Correct. Oh, wow. Interesting. Huh. So can you have traffic if you're the only car on the road? Is that still traffic? I would say yes. I guess so, sure. <laughs> I don't know of a word for no traffic except no traffic. Hmm. Yes, I win. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you do, Josiah. It's kind of a, a philosophical question there. Yeah, open, open freeways, open road. Yeah. Uh, on Google Maps navigation that I use to get around when I don't know what I'm doing, it's a, it's, I just tell my wife, it's green, meaning that there's no traffic because mm-hmm. the highways are colored green. Mm-hmm. You know what we'll do, mm-hmm. though? We have a lot of creative listeners, and if somebody remembers something or comes up with something, Josiah, we will pass it along, all right? All right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your call. Thank you. Take you care. too. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Maybe you're sitting in traffic and you're pondering a question about language. Why don't you call us about it once you get home? 877-929-9673 or send us an email. That address is words at waywardradio.org. And you can find us on Twitter at wayward. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Jill Enderstrode. I'm calling from Indianapolis, Indiana. Hi, Jill. Hi, how are you? All right, what's up? Well, um, my question involves the word yay, And our newspaper here in Indianapolis has a section called Let It Out, where people can kind of complain about things or just say random things that are then published in the newspaper. And my mom was reading the newspaper the other day. Someone was complaining about the way that kids these days use the word yay and spell it Y-A-Y when it's actually supposed to be spelled Y-E-A. And my mom emphatically agreed with this Indianapolis Star subscriber And I didn't actually realize that this was even an issue. My six-month-old daughter has a T-shirt that says, yay, Y-A-Y. I usually spell it Y-A-Y. And so I was wondering if maybe you all could weigh in on what the proper spelling of this word is or maybe how it's evolved to its current spelling. Kids, what's the matter with kids today? (laughs) It's very get off my lawn. (laughs) Yes. I like the way you described that. It's basically the the moaning section of the newspaper. (laughs) It's, um, I've heard it called the original Twitter. (laughs) The original Twitter. The agony, agony, the agonizing column, maybe we'd call it. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Okay, so this is complicated. So you're saying that your mom and the person who wrote to the Indianapolis Star believe that when we say yay, it should be spelled Y-E-A. Right, as in cheering. Okay, so the cheering. So yay, go team, they think it should be Y-E-A. Yes. Hmm. Okay, and you're saying it should be Y-A-Y. I don't 
necessarily have a preference, but I'm not sold on the idea that Y-A-Y is not a legitimate spelling. Yes. That, mm. Right there. You nailed the crux of it, Jill. That's the crux of it. The Y-A-Y use that is a celebratory and exclamatory and is about delight and excitement is Y-A-Y. And as a matter of fact, we don't have concrete examples of Y-E-A using, used in that kind of way in the last hundred years. Like Y-E-A, also pronounced yay, by the way, is typically relegated to formal text, legal text or legal arguments or legal situations. It is not the kind of thing that you encounter in day-to-day speech and haven't for, again, a century. Yeah, you see it a lot in the Bible. In the, yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Not, yay, verily. But they're not celebrating walking through the valley no. of the shadow of death. <laughs> I mean, maybe oh, wow. getting through it. But... <laughs> yeah, maybe getting through it, yeah. <laughs> yay! So these are two different yays, yeah. and to call them the same term would be a mistake. However... They do both come from the same origin. They go back to these these ancient Germanic roots that English has. All of the Germanic languages that I can think of have words similar to ye of either spelling that mean yes. And so this is connected. But what happened is over the, the millennia, this word has split off and we've gotten Y-E-S and we have Y-E-A and we have Y-A-Y and we have Y-E-P and we have uh, uh, Y-E-A-H. So they're, they're all connected etymologically. They've now, they're now distinct and have developed their own roles and their own properties in English. So this is not a victim of the text message? No. No, that, no that means like, I, I found examples. The, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary has an entry on this, but I found examples older than what they have to the 1930s of Y-A-Y being used in a celebratory way. So it's not the text messaging. It's not even the telegram era, I'm sure, the telegraph era. It's just a new word with a new meaning, and it kind of needs that new spelling to distinguish it from the other the other uses and the other meanings. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. And they're going to quibble with you and argue with you about this. You should just have them call me. I'll set them straight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Our pleasure, Jill. Jill, thanks for letting it out. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's kind of our Bye-bye. show, Let It Out, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it sure is, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for calling, Jill. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. If it's not a grammar peeve, then let it out. (laughs) Call us, 877-929-9673, or send us an email. That address is words at waywardradio.org, or hit us up on Twitter at wayward. Mary LaMarca from Hanover, New Hampshire, picked up some slang when she went on a cruise to Alaska, and she was talking with some of the locals there. She learned the term sucker hole. She says, since this part of Alaska's weather is so similar to the northwest coast weather of Washington and Oregon, it's often gray and cloudy and rains on and off during the day. Sometimes a patch of sky and sun will appear in the cloudy sky. The locals call this a sucker hole because so many tourists think the weather is going to clear and become sunny. But it never does. <laughs> she goes, oh, there's a little patch of blue. Obviously, it's yeah. going to go in the direction I want it to go. It will enlarge, and there will be sunshine. Yeah. I can wear my shorts. Yeah, but apparently this is pretty widely used. <laughs> That's awesome. Call us with a word you've picked up in your travels, 877-929-9673, or send it to us in email. That address is words at waywardradio.org. Hey, we've got something special for those of you who love our show but could do without the ads. That's right. Imagine a way with words, the same engaging conversations, the same deep dives into language without advertising interruptions. We're talking about our ad-free podcast feed. It's sleek, clean, and it's just for our supporters. It's at waywardradio.org slash ad-free. It's inexpensive, easy to sign up for, and works with all major podcast apps like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's an affordable way to support the show and get a seamless listening experience. And if you're feeling generous, why not give a subscription to another Away With Words fan? That's waywardradio.org slash adfree. Sign up today. Your support means the world. waywardradio.org slash Ad free. Thank you. You're listening to Away with Words, the show about language and how we use it. 
I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. We talked a couple of weeks ago on the show about whether cursive writing should be taught in schools. Oh, yes, we did. And boy, did we get a response. Wait, people had opinions about that? A very, what a surprise. very, very <laughs> strong Let's opinions. See. Ask a public radio audience a question <laughs> about cursive writing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was really striking because we talked about this years ago mm-hmm. and and the response was kind of mixed, but this time it was overwhelmingly in favor of teaching cursive writing to but kids in school. Even from the teachers? Oh, especially from the teachers. <laughs> yeah, we heard from uh, Walt Hamilton, who said, As a teacher, this is one of my soapbox issues. Scientific studies have confirmed that cursive writing is good for the brain, especially in relation to reading. Children with dyslexia benefit from cursive because each word is one stroke, going left to right. Letters cannot be confused, B and D, for example, and it aids small motor coordination and focus. Strategies for dyslexics are actually good for all children, so I'm a huge fan of bringing cursive back into school. And we also heard from a uh, professor of English at a community college who shared an interesting experience. She said, Last year, a student and I were reviewing one of his drafts in my office, and on a separate piece of paper, I was recording the elements we identified for him to address later, and I was writing in cursive. I filled almost half the page when he asked me if I could print it or send it to him in an email, and when I agreed but asked why, he told me he could not read cursive. We had quite a discussion, but he said he could neither read nor write cursive. I minimized my shock and sent the notes in an email, but I was profoundly depressed about this. I went home that day thinking he would not be able to read a facsimile or the original of the Constitution or any number of documents. It broke my heart. Yeah, we got a lot of responses like that. A you lot. Know, I've talked to my son about this who was not taught cursive in school either. He's 11 now. Oh, he has He can write his own name in cursive, uh-huh. but when you give him something in cursive, he can figure it out. So I'm kind of wondering if mm. we're not really talking about teaching people to write cursive so much as we're teaching them to read cursive. Oh, that's an you interesting You might have point. the knack for reading it and still not be able to write it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's he says it's fine. He says he can manage it. But I wanted to share one other tweet that we got. This is uh, somebody who goes by the handle Dr. C. Cole on Twitter. And she's a librarian and teacher in North Texas. And she says... I work in archives, special collections, and frequently need to decipher handwriting from earlier eras. Some of the undergrad student workers have trouble with this because they didn't learn cursive. So this is almost a professional capacity where not having cursive is a problem. It would be a detriment. Mm -hmm. You would not be able to accomplish your job. Right, if you're working in the post office. Right, yeah, absolutely, (laughs) because plenty of people still write in cursive. Yeah, but that's an interesting point about being able to translate it rather than generate it. Right. But I do think that the point that people made over and over and over very emphatically when they were writing to us was that there are advantages to being taught to coordinate your hand and your mind with generating cursive writing. I should note that I am no prime example of cursive writing. I have been asked to use a laptop in school in order to write my exams because my handwriting was so terrible. Nobody wanted to wade through 40 pages of a blue book in my handwriting. (laughs) Well, we're still taking your calls and emails about it. The address is words at waywardradio.org, and you can call us 877-929-9673. Hi there. You have a way with words. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. This is Pam from New York City. Welcome, Pam. What can we do for you? I would like to know about the derivation of the word toodaloo, if you can help me with that. I'm a woman of a certain age, and when my mother was a woman of a certain age, she was quite flamboyant. And every once in a while, she would say, okay, toodaloo, and I understood it to mean, see you later. And then I started studying French, and I learned an idiom. It was a tout à l'heure, and I think it meant uh, literally all to all the hour or to the next, and not the next hour. I'm not exactly sure. I was thinking that, you know, the GIs in World War II were from, a lot of them from New York, and they might have bastardized, if I can say that, a tout à l'heure 
with their Brooklyn and Bronx accents into toodaloo, you know, like that. So I've thought about this, and after hearing your show, I thought you might be able to shed some light on that. Well, i got to tell you, I love the thinking that you're doing. I'm going to give you an A-plus on part of it and an F-minus on part of it. <laughs> oh, that stings. <laughs> I'm teasing. I thought you could take it. You sound like a. You sound like you could take it. Um, tough New Yorker. Yeah, exactly. I'm an ex New Yorker, so I appreciate. I appreciate the toughness of a New Yorker. I got to tell you, the the part that I really like here is the French origin for toutelou, a toutelou, which basically means "see you later." And so, right. it it's a uh, colloquial in French, and it became colloquial in English in the early 1900s. So it's earlier than World War II, and it pops up in kind of the hip, cool set in London, like the the dancey, drinky, clubby types who kind of go around, the young folk, you know, the people, right. the, the kind of the high life that people were living before World War One set in, those kinds of folks. Uh-huh. And, and so it has a long life in the UK, pops over to the US here and there, but still in the language of a lot of Americans, toodaloo, especially if you add pip-pip at the end, um, <laughs> strikes them as, as British. It's stereotypically British, even though it's long since out of fashion. So so the part you're right on, I believe that it does come from the French and the part that you're not right on. And it's not Americans who did it. It's the British who did it. Uh-huh. Well, and then we got it from the British. Yeah, exactly. One thing that happened in the popularization of this term, it was shortened to toodles. Do you remember the show right. Gidget, the television show Gidget with Sally Field? Unfortunately, I do. Oh, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> well, Gidget used toodles all the time on the show to say goodbye. And so for a lot of people, uh, this is back when there weren't that many channels to choose from, and whatever was on was whatever was on. And and I believe that that is a source of popularizing the shortened form in the United States. Well, I appreciate it because this, you know, I need to get a life. <laughs> 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 Instead of wondering where the derivation of a tuteleur and tutelu no, and all that's that. that's a fine but life. Thanks, Keep it up. <laughs> okay, I'll call again. I will write you a doctor's and... <laughs> note. You have my permission. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Pam, you're a delight. Thanks for calling. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Pam. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Call us with your language question, 877-929-9673. You know, Grant, I was thinking more about our call with Paloma, who asked how we came to have our attitudes about language. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking I wanted to add something to that, which is that I talked about my, my mother criticizing people's grammar. Um, and I do think that there's a need to understand principles of grammar and basic grammatical rules. Right. We're because on that. grammar can be our friend if it helps us uh, express ourselves right. and express ourselves clearly. But the other thing about that is that so many of the grammatical rules that I've been taught, that my mother taught mm-hmm. in class, um, are just constructs and aren't, don't really have any basis in in logic or language. For example, the the old saw about not ending a sentence with a preposition. Which no grammarian that we know, and we know hundreds of them, would endorse. Right. right? Exactly. It's the result of 17th and 18th century grammarians trying to squeeze the swollen feet of English into the too tight shoes of Latin grammar. <laughs> it just, it it's nonsensical, really. Yeah, the, the, the zombie rule rules, as they've been called. Zombie These, rules. And, and the thing is, we can spout them about uh, split infinitives and yes. uh, and all these things. And, and many of these are not supported by the language. The language doesn't care. Modern style guides will specifically say that these are not actually rules in English. Right. Modern grammarians will say these are not rules in English. Many linguists and lexicographers say these should have never been rules in English. <laughs> right. And yet... They're out there like bits of useless folklore that keep getting passed along as if they're wisdom when actually they're little micro failures. Yes, yes, and making people uncomfortable mm-hmm. and, and, and reluctant to try to express themselves. So my point is that I wasn't saying anything goes right. whatsoever. Right, we never do. Um, but but uh, if you're worried about a grammatical rule, check it out. Yeah, I would also say there are lots of rules for English, but they're not necessarily the ones that you think they are. Well said. Give us a call, 877-929-9673, or email us at words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is David from Virginia Beach, Virginia. How are you? Excellent, David. Thanks for calling. Hi, David. For you? We moved down here as a family in 1991 from Buffalo, and uh, I retired from my 
previous employment last year, uh, bought a, a economic car, and I've been driving Uber for almost a year now. And um, I just noticed the last couple of months that um, some of the street names that I began to um, drop passengers off and pick them up on were, were a little bit odd for me. When I started, my, my GPS started to um, identify certain streets and parts of the uh, area of Chesapeake, which is a little more upscale. It would frequently say, um, you know, give, you know, like say instead of Thompson Street, it would say Thompson Key. And, of course, if, you, if you're familiar with, with GPS, you know, they have a voice, and I keep the voice up so the passenger can hear where we're going. But anyway, uh, two or three times into it, I eventually paid attention to the actual sign. And the sign, um, if, it's, if it's using that designation, um, it's, it'll say, like, Riverside, Q-U-A-Y. And every time I ask a local resident, you know, what does that mean? I, I still haven't, I haven't met anybody that knows what Q-U-A-Y means. And so I thought I'd give you guys a call. And So, David, yeah, the word spelled Q-U-A-Y is usually pronounced key. It came into English in the 1300s. Uh, spelled K-E-Y, but then it was changed uh, to the French spelling, which was Q-U-A-Y. And it meant a kind of wharf or like a, a constructed bank or landing stage for ships. So I'm not surprised that it's in that area, but I'm wondering if you're driving to subdivisions and they have the name Key, Q-U-A-Y, uh, if there's a wharf in sight. No, it's just generally like, you know, boulevard, street. Uh, square, you yeah. know, port, all those. Yeah, it's just it's mixed in those. In, there's nothing physically designated. It just it just gives that last, I guess you could say suffix or whatever whatever designation mm-hmm. you'd call it. But no, there's nothing. I mean, I could be literally uh, out in more of the rural areas where these new developments are, probably 25 miles from any waterway. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they still use that designation. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds like kind of aspirational naming, doesn't it? Yeah, there's a, there was an article in Entrepreneur Magazine earlier in 2019 that talked about nostalgia and faux-stalgia, where we give places names and streets names in order to make them feel old or more authentic. I wonder if it's some uh, of that. I wouldn't that be, makes sense. It is possible, however, that the key names for streets do continue an older tradition that is lost, that there used to be a key or used to be a wharf, and it's gone, and the names just have continued long after the the long after the thing. Um, for example, I'm thinking of Canal Street in New York City. There's no canal and hasn't been for a long time, mm. but there was once a canal. Wall Street in New York City, there's no longer a wall, but there used to be a wall. So I'm wondering if they're okay. used to, and you know, Makes in sense. some places they they start a. I've I've seen in some of these seaside towns they'll start a street coming off of a a wharf, a key, or a jetty, and they'll just continue it straight off into the distance, and it keeps the name the whole way. Mm. So I'm just wondering well, if there's some of that sense. happening too. Huh. Okay. Yeah, it's an odd one, but Q U A Y is usually pronounced key. So it's cool. Thank you, David, for your call. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, Have a wonderful care. day. Love your show. Thank Thanks. you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye-bye. 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Tracy, and I'm calling. I have a question for you. Um, my mother is from West Virginia, and I, I don't know whether she has made up words her whole life or whether it's she uses colloquialisms. And um, my son, who's 18, we were driving down the road the other day listening to your show, which we enjoy. Thank you very much. You. And um, he said, I should, you need to call in and ask. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about the word hornicaboogery. What is hornicaboogery? <laughs> boogery? Hornicaboogery is germs, basically. Cooties are germs. And w- when I asked my husband whether it was co- cooties or germs. He said it, it's germs because cooties have faces and germs don't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess in a sentence, we w- I would say something like, um, oh, you know, don't play with that kid over there with the snot running down his face. He's, he's got the hornicaboogery. Oh, oh my okay. Gracious. Gotcha. So this is kind of a, a, just a generic term for any kind of random illness you can't identify that looks contagious. Yes, yeah. And spell that for us. <laughs> I have no idea how to spell it. I mean, the horn part I could get in there, but and boogery. Uh-huh. But the 
nika part. I don't know. <laughs> Horn nika and, booger. And I don't know if my mom, if that's something she would have made up, but she said it was her family has just always used it. Wow. <laughs> for it's kind of the creeping crud. Yeah. 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 Okay. We're going to add that to our collection then because... <laughs> yeah, there's a whole bunch of terms for these yeah. random names for illnesses you can't identify. Yeah, gollywobbles, lupus stupus, lopsy lows. I like pantod. <laughs> You've Pan- never heard this one? This Not my this mom. one, no. No, no, the Dictionary of American <laughs> Regional English has a whole long list of these, um, but that one is not in there. Oh. I like Pantod on the Rummet. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I like the Can't Help It. <laughs> the Can't Help It. Or the School Bus Cramps. I like that one. <laughs> or the Carly Marbles or well, the Carly Wobbles. The School Bus Cramps, that's what you claim to have when you don't want to go to school. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't want to do your homework when coming home from school. Right. Either way. But, yeah, that's a new one on me. I Hornica yeah, boogery. No, we just always had the Hornica boogery. Well, I'll tell you what, Tracy, we're going to put the word out. Anybody who knows this term will surely email us or call us. And if we find out more, we'll talk about it on the air, all right? <laughs> that's great. Okay. Thank you for well, calling. thanks. It's, it's a good one. It, it, it works. It's outstanding. It's fun to yep. say. Hornica I'm going to adopt it. Thank and you. And I also yeah. like it sounds like it has <laughs> booger right. in there somewhere. Well, you have a great day. And thanks <laughs> for the show. We really enjoy it. <laughs> okay. Right, stay care. healthy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. There's a ton of these. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. Some of them are based on real words like epizootics is mm-hmm. connected to a horse disease. But, yep. But kind of generically, it just means he's got the, the crud. Yeah. Yeah. I like collywobbles. But yeah, me I too. I do like hornica boogeries. Collywobbles works on both sides of the Atlantic, but and sometimes it just means like the heebie-jeebies of the willies, mm-hmm. where you kind of got like you're kind of creeped out or freaked out, not necessarily ill. Mm, I think of it as, as a stomach thing. Well, do you have a family word that you'd like to share with us? Give us a call, 877-929-9673. Following up on our conversation about grandparent terms, we heard from John Polk, who tweets at Clichés Gone Wild, and he said that among the grandparent names in his family are uh uh-huh, named by oldest nephew on wife's side because my father-in-law would quote the Ray Charles Pepsi commercial, You Got the Right One Baby, Uh uh-huh. And the other one was Hoo-Hoo, named by oldest nephew on my side because my mom would say Hoo-Hoo to let him know she was coming when he woke up from a nap. (laughs) (laughs) Those are both very good. Uh Uh-huh and Hoo-Hoo. Yeah, Yeah, those are sort of organic uh, grandparent Rather than one passed on historically from other people you've known. Right. I'd answered uh Uh-huh or Hoo-Hoo. 877-929-9673. You can also find all of our past episodes on our website at waywardradio.org. Thanks to senior producer Stephanie Levine, director Colin Tedeschi, editor Tim Felton, and production assistant Tamar Wittenberg. You can send us a message, subscribe to the podcast, get the newsletter, or catch up on hundreds of past episodes at waywardradio.org. Our toll-free line is always open in the U.S. and Canada, 877-929-9673. Or send us your thoughts to words at waywardradio.org. Away With Words is an independent production of Wayward, Inc., a nonprofit supported by listeners and organizations who are changing the way the world talks about language. We're coming to you from the Recording Arts Center at Studio West in San Diego, California. Thanks for listening. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Until next time, goodbye. Bye.